Oh, oh, oh. 
All right, here we are. Welcome. Can you hear us, everybody? Let us know in the chat, maybe. Maybe we can split screen, right? Yes, okay. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one, go. If you could give us a thumbs up, if you can hear us, then uh, that would be great. Let us know in the chat on the side or, or below if you can hear us. Different live stream, different setup. I think now uh, I think this is a good a good setup on the couch, pretty relaxed, sets the tone a little bit for, for this talk that we have. Especially especially regarding the last time <laughs> when the sun was coming out. Oh yeah, too much trouble. And with the weather we currently have in Europe, I mean today is the first day that it has rained in the Netherlands for like the last two weeks, I think. So we are really this is actually the first time I think we're happy about rain in Amsterdam. Mm, yeah, that's true. <laughs> because there's usually way too much of it. So um now it has cooled down and um I think we're happy to sit inside with I mean still twenty six degrees but uh Celsius uh, for all yeah. those people who don't live in the metric system. Yeah. Yeah, it's good uh, to have you here uh, we've seen some activity in the chat already um for those of you who are still new here I and mean, it's the third time we do this um this monthly live chat or live stream is really just a conversation between you guys at home wherever you are and the two of us um we don't set specific topics for these live streams for I think the first part, you can always ask questions in the chat. So we do this kind of Q&A, uh, where we try to answer your questions as good as possible. Um, but we also have a couple of topics that we would like to talk to you about, uh, news updates, what's going on in our life, and also in, in, yeah, in our little company, Physiotutors, and what we are up to. Yeah, it's just a really relaxed hangout um, with you guys. So, yeah. Just ask us anything you want, and uh, we're going to try to answer it. Um, maybe as a first uh, update from our side, um, for the people um, who have already bought our ebook, we are working hard on the update. It's basically done. Uh, we just have to finish it up. Um, our Spanish colleague uh, Francisco is trying to um, finish the update and the translation into Spanish. Um, we will do spell checking and then I think in the next couple of days we're gonna release uh, our ebook 2.0 because it's an addition of around 50 new pages so we have close to 500 pages in the book now and um, so you can expect the update next week and the app our mobile app which is derived from our uh, ebook will also be updated of course yeah. it's also gonna happen in the next couple of days so like we promised in the beginning um, the book as well as the app we see it as a work of progress work in progress because we will keep um, shooting videos there's new information new studies coming out that um, change clinical values of tests that uh, change sensitivity specificity so the book is growing with the research and with the videos that we're shooting yeah so yeah like i said if you have bought the book keep an eye on your email inbox in the coming week where you should receive the um, the update to version 2.0 it'll just be a download link you download the book and you just open it as usual it should work flawlessly just by downloading the updated version and for the for the for the app if you have the app um, that just is pretty much a silent update so if you once we push all the new content to the app um, you should see it immediately but we will also put a release note in the app so like all the way if you scroll all the way down um you will see okay what have we added into which section but other than that it's just silent it's just more content updated content in the different different sections but yeah i think that again what kai said it's the promise that we it's something we promised you 
um, because I think we, we also want to do better than what the, the standard is of, of educational material that you find on the internet or, or in, in, in physio. So we want to, we hold true to, to our promise. We will give you free updates for the book. You bought it once, you will get the updates, the future updates free of charge because you know we know this profession is changing so rapidly things you know things change uh new research is emerging we produce more content and we just want to give you that all right i think we can dive into our q a session yeah um and then keep on talking about different topics that are going on in our lives in between so uh, peter ishak is asking how can how can I relieve neck muscle spasm? Um, I'm not sure if you mean something like torticollis or just general stiffness or loss of range of motion. So let me know if I'm answering the question not correctly. Or is it centrally mediated spasticity? You know, could also be, uh, be an option. But um, in general, um, what can relieve neck spasm or a neck that is not, not moving correctly in the short term we know that uh, neck or that uh, cervical manipulation and mobilization can help with uh, neck muscle spasm um, and in the rather long term a good solution is to focus on your deep cervical flexor muscles so for example you can um, perform exercises like uh, uh, high cranial cervical flexion exercise so basically just a nodding or exercises like in the cranial cervical um, flexion endurance test uh, described by Harris which will strengthen this area and at the same time we feel what these exercises are doing is to relax the more superficial muscles like the cervical extensors um, so there's a lot of research uh, for the benefit of those exercises long term. Um, apart from that, I think short term relief can also be achieved by stretching, which is an easy exercise for um, patients to do themselves. Um, and general strengthening of the scapular thoracic muscles. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Basan Singh says exercises for supraspinatus tendinitis. In, yeah. the, we uh, we posted a lot about it, like a whole series from start to finish. I mean, supraspinatus tendinitis or rotator cuff tendinopathy. Um, if you check our channel. Um, Kai produced this it's a four part series. Yep. So from like an acute stage um, towards, you know, increased loading towards um, towards eccentric strengthening towards plyometrics later on for mm -hmm. overt athletes. Um, check definitely go into the playlist section. And because we've been producing a lot of exercise content lately, one of the latest um, playlist is exercise and there on the bottom you should find um there we go you should find the um oh, where is that one second oh you forgot to add it to the yeah, exercise playlist that's that should be weird but if we go down here there you go so you have the plyometrics, you have a late phase, you have intermediate phase and early phase rehab. And I think even way back, Kai, you even produced, um, we produced a video on um, isometric exercises that you can do to relieve uh, rotator cuff related shoulder pain in an, uh, in an acute situation. Um, and also a painful arc relief exercise. So we have a lot of exercise content tailored to different phases in the rehab process that you can find on our channel. So it's pretty easy, easy advancement from, um, yeah, unloading the shoulder, moving it 
going into a more compressive neutral position, working external rotation in different different planes, incorporating uh, trunk movement, moving on to eccentrics, ball throws, plyometrics, and and perturbations later. Yeah. All right. Um, I think a question we always get uh, is about scapular dyskinesis from Nina. She's asking, how can you test if someone has a scapular dyskinesis? Um, we made a couple of videos on scapular dyskinesis. Mm. For example, the four type classification by Kipler. Um, then there's the scapular dyskinesis test by McClure. And we, we made a video about diagnosing scapular dyskinesis and how we can increase reliability in the diagnosis. Um, because the problem is that reliability is generally not too high. I think it's around moderate. So what I see, there's a moderate chance that Andreas will also see in a patient or someone else. So, uh, it's best if you check out those videos. Um, there are also two videos on, for example, uh, the scapular uh, retraction test and a scapular assistance test, which are rather modifying tests to see if scapular dyskinesis is uh, a contributing factor in shoulder pain. Um, but with all that being said, so we are not sure if we can reliably detect scapular dyskinesis if um, those tests, for example, uh, by, Mac, uh, by uh, Kipler, are compared with 3D kinematic analysis, then we see that even if people or the examiners observe scapular dyskinesis, it doesn't mean it's an accurate diagnosis because if you compare it to 3D kinematic analysis, um, this analysis often shows a different result. So this is also still a question, uh, questionable. And then as a, yeah, if we go even further along this uh, clinical reasoning uh, chain, then there's still the question if scapular dyskinesis is a contributing factor to the development of shoulder pain and what longitudinal research says, and there are five out there in the athletic population, and two of them only show that it's a contributing factor to shoulder pain in elite athletes. So uh, one population were rugby players, another population were elite handball players. In those two populations, it seems to be a contributing factor. In the others, um, there was no evidence of, uh, of scapular dyskinesis as a contributing factor to shoulder pain. And if we go even further down this uh, clinical reasoning chain, then the question still is if we can fix it, if we can change scapular kinematics. And there's a lot of research out there that shows that we cannot change kinematics. So no matter what you do in patients with shoulder pain, if you train a rotator cuff, they are going to get better. If you do scapular stabilization exercises, the shoulder pain is getting better. But shoulder kinematics or scapular kinematics usually don't change. Um, the best article to read is by McQuaid. I think it's called Scapular Dyskinesis. Are we on the right track? Um, and I know there is a late study from Togut et al, mm -hmm. Turkish researcher, 2017, who has actually shown that we might be able to change kinematics. So there's still a lot of debate going on. To be honest, we don't focus too much on it in practice. Um, like Adam Meekin says, is it a limp of the upper limp? So it's just something we commonly see in patients with shoulder pain. Um, doesn't change what I do with patients. I don't focus too much on it, to be honest. Mm. Okay, there was a lot of, a lot of information. I think it's a, yeah. the third time. Yeah, this yeah. Is, yeah it's a, that's the, also why I know it uh, yeah, by heart in the meanwhile. It's like rehearsed. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. a script. Okay. It's a script. You want to take the next question? Yeah, where is how to isometric resisted test of vastus medialis muscle and vastus lateralis muscle? Um, I don't think it's possible to isolate the... Because what do they both do? They are engaged in knee extension 
So you would test knee extension muscle strength um, and compare it to the unaffected side, not individually compare vastus medialis to vastus lateralis. I think if there was a deficiency in either of them, um, you would see side to side dif or, or more significant side to side differences in the extension strength. Um, but isolating them, yeah, that's, that's not possible. Yeah, I think I know where your question comes from because you see it in a lot of conditions like patellofemoral pain syndrome, that the vastus medialis is said to be um, weaker, uh, weaker yeah. or not firing well. The problem is that the innervation of the vastus medialis and vastus lateralis is by the femoral nerve. So it's one it's the one in the same nerve. And if it, if the nerve or uh, if it is firing, it's firing. So um, yeah, not, like Andrea said, not possible to distinguish. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I, think, I think we even have some, maybe you want to look it up in the meanwhile, I think we even have some papers who confirm that you cannot distinguish between uh, those two muscles. Mm. And you can also not train them in isolation. Um, Errol Pecker is asking, is there any special test specifically for frozen shoulder? I mean, the best thing, if a frozen shoulder is not hard to diagnose. Um, mm. The only problem is in the very early phase, it resembles subacromial pain syndrome, then it's basically impossible to distinguish those two. But as soon as we enter the freezing stage, um, there's usually uh, extremely limited active and passive range of motion. And we made a video on diagnosing frozen shoulder. And in this video, um, I mean, in next to patient history, uh, of course, which is always really important, there is basically one diagnostic test, and that's passive external rotation, which has to be 50% or less compared to the other side. And at least two other planes of motion are uh, restricted as well, and they have to be restricted at least 25% compared to the other side. So what you would usually do is test passive external range of motion, which is severely limited, compare it with passive flexion in the shoulder joint and passive abduction, and compare that to the other side. If they are limited, external rotation more than 50%, the other two more than 25%, then you basically get your diagnosis. And there that, was the, yeah. the coracoid pain test, right, to differentiate this true or pseudo pseudo frozen shoulder um this was right here yeah a researcher named holman uh, is doing a lot of research on the field of uh protective protective muscle spasm in a uh, frozen shoulder and what he basically found was that there is always some kind of active muscle guarding so even if you suspect there's frozen shoulder then um yeah, in some cases, um, they get anesthetized, for example, by a surgeon, and then they move freely. Yeah? Exactly yeah. when when they are anesthetized. So, in this case, if you suspect that it could be a pseudo frozen shoulder, then the coracoid pain test seems to be a pretty good test. It's from Carbone, two thousand and ten, I think, um, with pretty good sense and specs values. Uh, in a group of patients with shoulder pain. Uh, just check out a video, I think, um, or those two videos on diagnosis and the coracoid pain test. Yeah, and then of course you have the papers in the video description. So here's whether there's active stiffness. And the second one is Carbona, like I said, 2010, which discusses the coracoid pain test. Videos on our channel. Um, should there also be a playlist on, on frozen shoulder where you also have the the diagnosis video where we discuss the the clinical features necessary no okay do you want to continue yeah where are we what is the physiological changes in joint stiffness and how to treat it well what's the joint joint stiffness results from uh, from the the joint capsule I mean, it's, it can be a lot of factors, let's say like that. 
It can be changes of the articular surfaces, so changes in in uh, in uh, cartilage quality, cartilage density, um, like in 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 arthritis, joints move less due to incongruencies in joint surfaces, uh, maybe osteophyte formation on joint edges, which limits joint mobility. Um, it could be um, yeah, a lot less of joint lubrication, um, so less, less viscous synovia, which limits joint uh, physiological joint movement. Um, you could have like you could have uh, collagen changes in, in or changes in the collagen matrix of the connective tissue around the joint. Um, you could have. Um, it can also be so can also reasons. be a joint capsule contracture like in frozen shoulder that could be something yeah you know um yeah and then the question is how to treat it yeah you want Load, to loading progressive loading yeah i think it's easiest i don't think uh i think it also also depends on what you expect is limiting <laughs> it's getting hotter yeah. in here already uh, <laughs> roasted 27 degrees now <laughs> no but um if it really depends on uh what your goal is i think for example in frozen shoulder if it's really uh, a contracture of the joint uh, capsule itself then you would want to change collagen and we are not even sure if we can change collagen because it needs a uh, prolonged stimulus. So in those patients, that, that's also why it's recommended to uh, do end range uh, held mobilizations and that they do passive mobilizations themselves as many times as possible for as long as possible or, record, or as, as much with as, yeah, what they can tolerate. If we are talking about um, for example, rather um, something like um, um, decreased quality of synovia, for example, or uh, the, the, the more uh, maybe neurological, or how do you call it, neurophysiological limitation of a joint so that for example pain in a joint capsule is limiting then i think uh, normal manipulation or mobilization um, has a lot of neurophysiological effects that can change the limitation in range of motion directly or joint stiffness directly so it kind of depends on what what is limiting the movement yeah do you have any think, any more ideas yeah. yeah i think if if it's really tissue related collagen related loading in as close to end range as possible mm. and repeatedly and no. as many times as possible and as tolerated should do the trick you know i mean there are like like some conditions um, you know maybe maybe mtp1 arth arthritis that progresses yeah the the, the joint range of motion loss will be progressive and you know if it's bone on bone if it's if it's uh, osteophyte on osteophyte yeah that's a hard limitation that you won't mm. be able to overcome yeah. but soft tissue related load in end ranges it's the same what ballet dancers do you know they stretch continuously load end range movements so they achieve greater range of motions ranges of motion okay i think uh let's move on leonard smets is asking can calf muscles be trained more often than other muscles like two times per day for hypertrophy <laughs> um i don't think so there was a uh, research by schoenfeld et al brad schoenfeld follow him on social media is pretty active there they uh did a study or a review lately and what they showed, and I think it was in general for any muscle group, that two to three times per week as for the frequency is the perfect stimulus for hypertrophy and that additional training sessions per week for a muscle group don't have an additional effect. So two is better than one. 
or it might be even three they say but not more than that and then there's also the evil word genetics right i think especially with calves that's like always one of the muscle parts that people have trouble building mass or like to get hypertrophy uh yeah not everybody builds huge calves um that's it's just genetics and that you can't fight unfortunately mm -hmm. so yeah <laughs> team small calves okay Surai kuma is asking so why does the quadriceps uh so why always quadriceps goes for atrophy earlier than any other muscle during immobilization I have a do you have, I have a couple of the ideas so I can I imagine know, is, that, is that is that proven that's that's the question number because, one like yeah. I would expect uh, that you have you know progressive muscle loss in any muscle that you don't load you know um, I'd say something like I mean, now, now you can also go for like the yanda, it's like the postural muscle and, you know, that theory. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it's a huge muscle also. You see it uh, more drastically. I think it, it if, if that's actually a thing, that, it, that the atrophy occurs more in the quadriceps. Um, one reason is because we constantly load it every day more than any other muscle most probably even if you don't go to the gym because everyone has to walk everyone has to walk stairs and then out of a sudden if you don't have any stimulus um, so if you have for example i don't know after fracture you cannot load uh, your leg for like six weeks i think then it's just a huge difference between what the muscle is usually used to the, to the load that the muscle usually gets and um, the difference is just huge then I think it's a huge muscle in the body with a lot of type 2 fast uh, so fast twitch fibers um, and I think they they are bigger in size and I think they uh, are wasted quicker than the slow twitch fibers um, because there's also a principle principle i don't know how the principle is called franz bosch is describing it in his book so if you are using a muscle first of all using the small twitch fibers or, or the, the the slow twitch fibers if you need additional uh, strength then on top of that you are using the uh, fast twitch fibers the bigger fibers so i think that's the reason why um the the quadriceps atrophy could be uh, more clear and it's a huge muscle you see it earlier than in other muscles so i think the difference of an unloaded uh, quadriceps compared to normal quadriceps is just huge um, if you calculate ratios ratios it would most probably be less mm. So that that all I that, that's it's like what what yeah. I what I can come up with uh, on the fly, or what pops in my mind directly. Um, do you want to continue? How do you start your rehab when you've been immobile for six weeks after lateral patella dislocation with a small medial patella avulsion fracture? All ligament seems intact from radiography. No. So six weeks, that's, Im yeah, like we touched on immobilization due to your fracture for it, most probably. How do you start your rehab? Getting up. You know, you can probably start with, you probably did some quad sets, you know, in unloaded position. Um, you know, I don't know what you've did. I mean, being immobile doesn't mean that you can't re start your rehab already, right? Yeah. That's not a death yeah. sentence that you, only because you got status of non-weight bearing for six weeks that you can't do anything. Um, you could, you could probably 
ideally you have done you know like hip strengthening exercises unloaded position you've done straight leg raises maybe with an ankle weight uh side lying abductions you know even you know even upper body exercises training your other leg doing single leg work on on the on the unaffected leg so because we know that there no. is transfer from even if you work the unaffected limb that there is transfer in hypertrophic stimulus towards the uh, towards the opposite limb um, so I don't know you know maybe get some more input if you're really like starting from zero now um, you know start with you know working your hip um, in unloaded position in loaded positions you know mini squats I think something that if you've done some some prior training during the, oh, those six weeks you know what would I do? I'd probably do some some mini squats first. Um, yeah, general conditioning, you know, yeah. cardiovascular conditioning, cycling on an ergometer, you know, walking, treadmill walking. Yeah, yeah I think uh, if, if I had a patient, I'd also um, pay attention to the mobility of the knee. If it was immobilized, I think, uh, I don't know how it was in your case, but I had a patella dislocation. So for the first week I was in a stiff cast and then I had a mobile cast so I could flex to 90 degrees. So you want to make sure that the patella mobility um, is normal and if not mobilize the kneecap um, and also mobilize the tibio, uh, the, the, uh, the, Jesus Christ, the tibiofibial, yes, the, Tibiofemoral? Tibiofemoral uh, joint. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that on top, maybe next to the exercise that uh, Andreas mentioned. But yeah, there's no like, you know, I will do this, this and this. Depends on the patient. You know, what can the patient do? It's a bit of trial and error. What does the patient or what does the patient need to get back to? That's something else. Um, That's most important. Okay. Um, Federico Emeri is asking, any tips to enhance patients' compliance to their home exercise program? Do you provide them with some written material? Mm, I usually give one or two max. One or two exercises that are easily done, you know, maybe don't require a lot of equipment. Um, and I always ask the patients, because every patient nowadays has a smartphone, do you want me to film you doing the exercise or do you want to film me doing the exercise? That's the easiest. Um, we haven't really worked with like electronic exercise prescription systems. Um, I think that's, yeah. Right now, I don't think I, I, we need it yet, but it's just like, okay, do you understand the exercise? Okay, show me. Do you want me to film you? Uh, do you want to film me? And then they go home, they have it on their phone, and then they can do it. Um, yeah, and of, but the, the, I think the biggest thing, and I think that's uh, the, the, the problem with a lot of patients, they, they get their exercise uh, program, maybe like two sheets of, of exercises, but they may understand, okay, how how they do how they have to do the exercises but i think where compliance really uh you know hits rock bottom is because they don't understand why they are doing the exercises right um they they you may have told them okay what what the problem is you gave them a diagnosis um but i think ultimately it comes down to them not understanding why they have to do you know, glute bridges. What does that do? You know, I have knee pain. Why are you having me do uh, glute bridges, for example? Like proper understanding why they have to do it and don't bombard them like one or two exercises max that they have to do or that yeah. they should do. Yeah, maybe to also add uh, what Adam Meekin says, when shit is fun, shit gets done or something. Um, I mean, if you can make an exercise fun, of course, they're, they're more likely to do it. But it's also easier said than done, I think. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, some exercises are not, you know, they're no fun. I mean, it's it's rehab, you know. I think people would like to spend their, their time with, with, you know, funnier things than rehab. So, yeah, I think they sometimes you got to, you know, bite your lip and, and, and push through. And even if the exercise is not fun, but I think it's important that they understand why they do what they do mm. and that they don't have to go through a whole encyclopedia of, yeah. of exercises. Uh, maybe, yeah, what, what I do personally is sometimes I draw stuff and it looks terrible. I can't uh, draw, I, so I refuse. I also can't do it, <laughs> but I, I sometimes draw stuff and I ask patients, uh, how do you think you can fit this exercise into your day? So I find like they tend to forget the exercises. So I'm trying to figure out when is a good time for them to include those exercises in the daily program. I mean, we are working at um, at a clinic that is attached to a personal training space. So they usually or a lot of patients see a personal trainer. So I tell them when you're done with the personal trainer with the session, then make sure you're doing 10 minutes of the exercise I gave you. And this way you make sure that you at least do them two or three times per week. Um, depends on a patient. All right, uh, the mana 19 is asking, are there books that you guys can recommend in Dutch in the area of complex pathologies? I don't think we don't read a lot of uh, Dutch books, to be honest. And I'm not sure what you mean with complex pathologies. Do you mean in the scope of musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal rehab? or rather complex patients with comorbidities like uh, diabetes, like um, uh, Crohn's disease uh, and so on. So not sure if uh, I have ideas, to be honest. No. What's no. the book that we have for the masters that discusses like, but that's just like, regular you know stuff that you see in in primary care uh, not like ro rare pathologies but that's a, is that a book on an, uh, diagnostics and therapy i don't know mm. i wouldn't even know diagnostics i think it's deuce now deuce is uh, neurology Do yeah you, okay right uh let me and check and L yeah, is, uh, this one. is a diagnostics book. Yeah. Yeah. Orthopedic manual therapy diagnosis. That's from the L. And then there's also uh, there was another one. Uh, it's Verhagen. Yeah, but it's not really on complex uh, pathologies. No, no, not no. complex pathologies. No. For Hagen is rather a quick overview about evidence-based practice for different mm, body regions. Yeah. Pretty good book to also get uh, an idea about like basically from incidence to prevalence to diagnostic uh, accuracy studies to treatment methods. So it's, it's like a quick handbook. Yeah, sorry to uh, not be of much help in this case. Akash Nath uh, is asking, how can I straighten my back? Not sure what is like what part of your back you're referring to. And the curvatures in your spine are completely normal. You have three of them. Completely yeah. straighten it would defeat the purpose of this spine acting like a spring yeah. and help with load bearing and shock absor absorption. Yeah. So having those curvatures is normal. Uh, an example that I always give is uh, or uh, are ballet dancers who have a pretty straight spine in a lot of cases and they have a lot of back problems. So like Andrea said, there is a purpose that we have two curves in the spine. But to still trying to answer your question, <laughs> I'm assuming that you're referring to uh, a, thor a okay. thoracic kyphosis or maybe scoliosis. Let's say yeah, we take the example of kyphosis um what you could do is you could try to self-mobilize your thoracic spine regularly 
and I mean there's a bunch of exercises um, like the what's it called cat cow uh, exercise for example uh, so especially in uh, the direction of extension and rotation uh, is where people are usually limited this is what you could do but you would have to do it daily and I think in a lot of cases it's the limitation or a, a back that is yeah has pronounced curves um, it's not only a matter of trying to change the range of motion it's more a matter of habits as well so um, what you could try to do but it's really hard to do because it's a habit would be to change your posture easier said than done and uh, you should also not overdo it because i think we see more people with back problems because they're trying to sit up straight with uh yeah. tensed erector spina all the time so they they are having problems to just let go and to just relax and and hang all right um kayanji is asking if you have arthritis how would you treat the patient think it's what he means is osteoarthritis yeah just correct us if we're if wrong but, um, talk, yeah. because there's also rheumatoid arthritis but generally oa that's really you know decreasing sensitivity if a patient is really really sensitive right you know coming in maybe having lots of joint pain um decreasing that sensitivity and then building them up strengthening strengthening there are so many yeah big guidelines big systematic reviews showing strengthening is the way to go in a way in terms of increasing capacity and having positive outcomes yeah so yeah progressive progressive exercise programs yeah i i always have discussions on facebook about uh with our follower uh, simon kirkegaard a uh, really good guy knowledgeable guy and he's always asking why blame osteoarthritis as the cause of pain and he's right because uh, we see a lot of people who have arthritis or osteoarthritis and who do not have any uh, pain so what he means is look at the patient and try to see what is sensitizing him and it can be a lot of cases it, it can be psychological factors psychosocial factors um, it can be false uh, beliefs about osteoarthritis um, and what we see is that lack of movement is making osteoarthritis uh, worse so uh, we see osteoarthritis mainly in people who completely overload structures like in elite runners they seem to have more osteoarthritis of the knees, for example, uh, or people who are inactive. So, um, like Andrea said, getting those people active, exercise, um, will decrease their pain levels. So, I think an increase of 30 to 40% of quadriceps strength has been shown to decrease their pain but exercise also has a lot of a uh, specific effects on the pace, pain system so all of those factors will um, improve the patient's uh, status so the joint itself the cartilage quality cannot really be changed anymore once it's damaged but um, this doesn't mean a patient has to be pain has to be in pain yeah, I think you can, if you want, if you're interested, you can read the discussion on on Facebook. One of our posts was on a um, strengthening program for knee osteoarthritis mm. on our Facebook page. Okay, Maya Bum is asking, how can I strengthen my feet after laser rehab because of Achilles partial rupture? laser there was laser i just heard lasers okay but it doesn't matter partial achilles rupture how can i strengthen my feet i think andreas did um yeah the, no. there was a, a three-part video series on just like a couple of 
of very very simple exercises um, proposed in early rehab of uh, Achilles tendon rupture repair rehab so there was an, a rupture they repaired it and and what you can do there um, pretty much you can apply the same the same exercises to that um, of course if you have a partial rupture you know caution should be taken that it doesn't progress to a full tear i don't know what led to the partial tear um, and also what your um, you know what you do in terms of sports for example do you play a lot of high impact sports cutting sports uh, which predispose you um, towards greater risk um, yeah i don't know what kind of medication you take if you take any um, like cortisone or cortisol um, that can also weaken tissue quality of your of your tendon um, but uh, yeah check out it's one of the latest three videos that we posted on how you can gradually build up loading of the achilles tendon and start from there yeah. so it's gonna be yeah um just like going from one toe on the other i'll just pull it up right now you know stepping from one toe on the other going like flat ground um doing flat ground calf raises here and there's like this like early rehab so that was in an unloaded position but like you would probably be here you know you can do ankle strengthening exercises moving into plantar flexion moving into dorsiflexion as tolerated uh, adding therabands uh, as resistance for example you can move into uh, adduction abduction um, adding um, resistance band to that um, but something like this you know stepping onto your toes starting to load the calf starting to load the achilles tendon um, progressing from that into single leg balance more like isometric contractions also of your calf in a stabilizing function um, doing calf raises you know change the base of support working on some some um, some balance you know do squats get that get those legs you know strong flat ground uh, calf raises starting from level ground and later on possibly moving into a more into a negative so going beyond neutral and getting that stretch starting on two legs progressing onto a single leg calf raises and then later on as you progress you know involve some plyometrics do some little jumps with the jumps what you can also do um, there's a nice little um uh, something that I saved for calves. This was a pretty from the st strength therapist. See, like using a heavy resistance band around a pole, which will help you in in the jumping and decelerating. You know, if you are moving, progressing to to plyometrics, that's something that you can do. All right, uh, let's continue. There is a question. I was just uh, looking for. Man, I'm so warm. Yeah. <laughs> It's still 27 degrees. Oh, yeah. And um, we said it. 99 problems. Way too hot for live streaming. Agree. I'm always so happy that it uh, has cooled down. Uh, um, Hussein Alkabas is asking, I have DDD, DDD in L5 as one. I want to keep my legs strong without loading weights on my spine. I do squatting on Swiss ball behind my back. Can I do more? Is lunch is good? Single leg squats? Any idea? Okay. Um, to answer your question, um, first of all, um, how do you know you have DDD? Have you had an MRI, for example? And is it? Do you have uh, symptomatic uh, back pain currently? Because if you don't, there are a lot of studies showing that. The prevalence of disc generation is huge, even in uh, the young population. There is the study that is really famous from Brinikai. Uh, I was I try to pull it up, 
but it showed it took me too long but it showed that i think in our age group um at the age of 30 even around 30 percent of asymptomatic people have this generation um so if this is the case if you just had an mri and you saw it and you don't have any back pain i wouldn't worry about it because um the intervertebral discs uh, are nurtured by loading the discs and by deloading the discs so uh, only the outer parts are really well vascularized so they get nutrition in and out by the bloodstream the rest is basically like a sponge so nutrition are squeezed out on load and or waste products uh, are squeezed out by load and after the load is removed um, uh, nutrition are sucked into the uh, intervertebral disc like a sponge um, if you do have current back pain uh, the best advice is to uh, gradually load your spine so don't think about um, like completely removing weight on your spine I wouldn't do it just try to see um, for example with the squatting like what is a weight that you can handle without aggravating your situation um, and then current or, or gradually work your way up um, so do the squats see if you can handle it if you can increase the weight uh, lunges are great single leg squats are great um, yeah don't fear your MRI because uh, most probably an MRI of my uh, back doesn't look much better yeah, and true. I don't have any pain at the moment nothing to add That's, this is one for yeah. you what's yeah, the best one more yeah. and uh, I think we have a couple of more okay, things we yeah. want to talk about yeah? okay what's the best physio management for myositis or sificans? you had a patient right with the no I had no I had um, fib fibrodysplasia FOP. I had an FOP patient, not myositis ossificans. This similar concept, um, fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva was my patient, FOP. I don't know if that's the same thing. I did have a patient with FOP. In my very first clinical placement in a hospital in, in, in Switzerland, uh, which is crazy if you that there are only 700 registered cases worldwide um, on the condition. Um, but yeah, that was pretty difficult, um, like treatment wise for, for this patient. Um, you know, I don't have an answer if that's similar to myositis of significance. I don't know what the, the, the path of physiology is with that, but it sounds similar. You have an inflammation of muscular tissue, which then ossifies, so turns into bone. No, uh, it's which, calcification of muscle. Which is pretty much the same thing that happens in fibrodysplasia of significance progressiva, but any connective tissue so even tendons um, ligaments they ossify in that condition it is super scary to see a dissected skeleton of somebody who has had the condition because pretty much they are imprisoned in their own body as the ossification continues the problem there is or the problem with her back then was that um, usually those people they get diagnosed with the condition because they, um, you know, they fall as a child, maybe they break, you know, maybe they break an arm and the, the resulting um, ossification, you know, the bone heals, but they have uh, hypertrophic growth of bone, they, you, they feel bumps, you know, maybe they fall from a tree and they just have a big bruise, but even that small tissue damage to capillaries in the muscle, in and around the muscle, um, like a like a just a bruise turns into bone, and then that's when they usually get diagnosed. And then there's the problem with 
with what's the best treatment there is no there are no trials on what the best treatment is with those people because there are just 700 registered cases worldwide it's pretty hard um most of the people they get you know they live their life as good as possible trying to avoid any tissue trauma um they carry a pass with them saying okay please don't give me intravenous injections don't give me any shots because even that tissue trauma can trigger uh, uh, inflammation and and ossification um, and they don't really get physio treatment per se because they need physio they get admitted to hospitals regularly because they suffer lung infections because through ossification um, of the intercostals or any any other muscles that help in 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 breathing you know they have they can't clear the airways a lot so they suffer a lot of, of uh, um, airway infections which is why they get admitted to hospitals and usually also the case why they pass away be, due to pneumonia for example um, for for the patient what we did um, I was like a first year student back then, but I worked with her the entire 10 weeks I was uh, on, on the placement. We did a lot of, uh, the, 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 the hospital had a pool and I also did my in-service on the condition, you know, doing a review on what it is, what's known to the team because they also weren't inexperienced because you can't push those patients a lot, you know. Um, you can push them to muscular failure, possibly inducing some form of inflammation, which uh, can trigger the ossification. So we did a lot of pool exercises, like floating, just her gentle movements, um, doing gentle movements in the pool, working a little bit with the water resistance, but taking away some of the load. And for the rest, yeah, there's, there's no like protocol do this with that patient. Again, I don't know if that applies. I just wanted to tell the story. If that applies to myositis as well. Okay. I'm going. I'm just going to go through the remaining questions as quick as possible. So, like ten seconds for an answer. Oh, yeah. I want to hear your opinion on manual therapy. Which concepts do you prefer? I mean, our opinion is positive because we're doing a master's degree, so we are highly biased. Uh, don't prefer any concepts. Concepts. Um, the only thing we know is that the effect is most probably neurophysiological neurophysio mostly and not so much bio uh, biomechanical um, and it works great on short term but should always be supplemented with exercises or the other way around basically a supplement to exercise therapy. Which books do you recommend about clinical reasoning and physical therapy? I think there's not really a book um, it's more the best thing you can do is stay critical um, don't be satisfied with the answers you get in school ask for reasons why and uh, keep on reading articles and try to get to the bottom of why certain things are done or why ask yourself in practice why do you do certain treatments um, shout out to the Philippines happy to hear that uh, you guys are watching us from there would love to visit your country um, cryotherapy worsens inflammation please explain this i don't know if it worsens uh, inflammation but i mean what is kind of logical is it's inflammation is our basic reaction to any damage um, so why stop it through icing the only thing that research shows is that ice can decrease pain but it doesn't basically improve outcomes um, in, in any rehab process. Uh, what else? No, we don't know the pathology frozen hip. I don't. So I also don't know the uh, treatment protocol according to Huxma. Uh, I think I've seen the name Huxma in relation to uh, traction manipulation of the hip but that's about it I have to look it up uh, contraindications for Sudex syndrome never really had it don't really know what it is so sorry for that um, yeah, more with Sudex. 
Okay, I think that's a quick wrap up. I mean, if we don't, if we didn't have time now to answer your question, you can always feel free to send us a message on any social media uh, channel. So YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, or even Twitter and Snapchat. <laughs> so you can always reach out. We always answer every message that we get. Um, so feel free or you can uh, check in with the next um, live stream that we're going to do in a month. So it's always the first Saturday of a month. Yeah, right? something or now, like, yeah, now more like or less. Last. Now it's like the it's last. It's like once a month, but you can always check in there. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you will get a notification once we go live and you can always find it in the live section as well. Uh, maybe something about um, the the messages. We get a lot of messages on on um, I have this and that. What can I do? Um, please uh, know that we can't give you completely tailored advice. You know, uh, when we see a patient for the first time, it's an hour face to face getting to the bottom of the problem, which of course we can't do to the same extent on social media. Uh. On which, messages which is exactly the same when i come back home to my family and they tell me i have pain here what is it it doesn't work like that yeah. i also tell my family that so that's that's the thing yeah. um, okay um then another question to you guys uh now that you are watching i mean if uh the world doesn't uh, stop spinning we will most probably reach 100,000 subscribers true yes <laughs> in a couple of weeks which uh, has been a long dream of ours when we never never thought we were going to achieve that i can remember when we were like we had a hundred like, like that was already fantastic. thinking about it uh, a couple <laughs> of years ago so i mean we are thinking about a special video of course is there anything that you would like to know or see from our side I think we were thinking about, I don't know, a couple of private things as well, so that you see actually are, uh, besides being the physio tutors, so who are Kai and Andreas, what do we do during our day when we're not shooting? Um, that was one idea, but I mean, feel free to, to come up with suggestions. Do you have a challenge for us, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I think, you know, maybe you have a challenge for us uh, that we should do on camera and do that for 100,000. Yeah, it can be anything. anything. So if you have a good idea, just uh, yeah, just feel free. Um, yeah, a short, short couple of updates. Uh, what are we up to? We mentioned the book already, uh, the update and the app. We are still uh, working on... Uh, publishing our first orthopedic assessment course uh, and I think we've been working on this for like three years now because um, we always yeah. yeah we always add stuff we, yeah. we want to refine it um, yeah it's 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 a big course that we're going to release I think covering almost one academic year worth of content yeah so it's yeah it's going to be good but we're, we're going to I think this is uh -huh. this this year is the time okay now you can find it it will be announced for sure but you can find the page on study.physiotutors.com and what it will be about is basically if you combine our book app stuff we do on the channel papers that we post basically our whole clinical reasoning process combined for the most common pathologies in musculoskeletal diagnosis and a little bit of rehab suggestion so it's basically our clinical reasoning behind what we do um that's about it i mean i think i think, yeah. I think that's it yeah yeah we're going on vacation too right you're going away Austria, right? I'm going to be in Austria for a week, mm. just camping. And then in October, I'm going to be in Sri Lanka. So if you're from Sri Lanka, maybe I'm going to see you. Who knows? Uh, really looking forward to that. Um, I'm going to be in Greece, end of August. Kos, the island of Kos, one week. A little bit of relaxing. Um, 
Oh yeah, maybe real quick right here. The course will be live on study.physiotutors.com, a website that we don't promote a lot yet. Um, oh yeah, see, 1,992 more subscribers till we hit 100,000. Um, right down here, there we go. This will be the course, it says coming soon. Um, stay tuned for that you will definitely see announcements for it once it goes live all right i mean the time always the flies so flies. yeah and we're uh, i'm gonna shut uh, shut the chat that's it uh so i'm gonna eat now Merry maybe Christmas. We're gonna, maybe maybe we're, maybe we're gonna play maybe we're gonna play some tennis if Andreas Elbow allows it. Um, and I think as always, thanks a lot for watching the live stream. Thanks for your questions. Yeah. Um, we really enjoy this format. I mean, we're always thinking about coming up with topics that we can discuss as well. But yeah, I think it's the conversation. You know, other we don't want this to be a one-way street. You know, we post three videos per week, you know, putting information out there, but it's really, we value the comments that you write under those videos on social media, but like ask that you ask us questions, giving you the chance to do this in a, in a, you know, in a relaxed fashion. Having this conversation is what it's about. And this is also what makes it so great that we can talk for more than an hour. Yeah. All right. Enough said. Yeah, we're going to wrap yeah. it up. Thanks for watching, guys. And uh, see you in four weeks.